with Cajun Cardboard coming at you from the great state of Louisiana. I decided to have a little fun today and pick apart ESPN's top 100 players of 2022-23 season list. This is where ESPN sort of released it this in segments where they did like, you know, 100 through 50 or whatever and then through 26 and they kind of did a little countdown or whatever just to get some hype going towards the NBA season. ESPN is notoriously horrific at putting these lists together. Absolutely, astonishingly horrific. And this list is no different. There's a lot of things on here that are just inexplicable that stand out. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the players that I thought were too uh, poorly ranked on their list and some of the players that were ranked way too well on their list. I'm, I don't want to say high and low because that gets confusing, but I've highlighted the players on the list in red that I think are ranked way too high and do not belong where they are uh, it, or maybe shouldn't even be on the list at all. And then I've ranked players that I think should be ranked better in yellow. And so we'll talk through some of that. Um, a lot of the problems that I had surprisingly were with players towards the back end of the list. They actually weren't too bad in their top 20, which leads me to think that, you know, they paid somebody to pay very close attention uh, to the first 20 to maybe 25. And then after that, they were just bullshitting and they just started picking straws out of a hat or looking at last year's list and really did not put a lot of thought into who's entering their prime, who's old, uh, you know, what their numbers were and their PER and things like that were last year. I mean, there's a lot of these that just don't make any sense. So I don't want to take a ton of time. I'm pulling them up right now. Let's see what we got. So here's the list. I've got it. I've just cut and pasted it into an Excel spreadsheet because I am completely unprofessional and my audio visual is completely lacking as always. So I've just got an Excel spreadsheet, which is about as sterile a presentation as you could possibly hope for. But the content's going to be good. Let's talk about it. Um, first and foremost, Kevin Love being in anybody's top 100 is preposterous. I don't know how many different ways to say it. Uh, he is well, well, well beyond his prime. Prime Kevin Love would be in the top 10, but uh, Kevin Love as currently situated has no business being in anyone's top 100. He wasn't in the top 100 last year on ESPN's list. Why they think he's going to be better than he was last year, I have no idea. Uh, but we can pull up Kevin Love and, of course, ignore all these credentials because we're not talking about, you know, historical uh, value or anything like that. We're talking about what they're going to do for their teams this year. Kevin Love is maybe the sixth or seventh best player on the Cleveland Cavaliers. I find it very hard to believe in a 30-team league that the Cleveland Cavaliers have six or seven of the top 100 players in the NBA. I think we can all agree that's probably not the case. Last year, Kevin Love was 13-7-2. and two. He shot it poorly from the field goals. Uh, he did shoot the three ball pretty well for a big guy. He's always great at free throws. His PER is really good. And so I think maybe that's what snuck him into the top 100. 19.6 is a really good PER. Just remember, you know, he's playing against second units and his minutes are way, way, way down. I mean, he played, what did he play last year? 22.5 minutes. It's easier to be efficient um, when you're playing fewer minutes just because there's less responsibility. And you'll see this oftentimes. He's playing against second units for the most part. So his PER kind of does stand out, but he does not belong in the top 100. There's no way Kevin Lowe is the 97th best player in this NBA. Uh, for instance, nobody in the NBA uh, would put Kevin Love in the same category as Keegan Murray as far as, uh, you know, value or ability or what's expected of them this season. Um, you know, and the same can be said about some of these other guys that are near him, like D'Angelo Russell and Kevin Love is a no-brainer. I get it, D'Angelo Russell's not won anything. He's not necessarily contributed to winning. I get all that, but, I mean, come on, man. Kevin Love is like the sixth or seventh best player on the Cavs team now that Mitchell's been added on that team with Garland and Mitchell and Allen and Mobley. And, um, and hell, we're about to get to another player that's over rank Karis LeVert, right, being better than Kevin Love. I mean, they're talking about Dean Wade maybe being the starting small forward in Cleveland. If that's the case, then Kevin Love and Karis LeVert do not belong on this list. If Dean Wade is their best option at that position, Kevin Love and, uh, and um, Karis LeVert do not belong on this list. The next person that I don't think belongs, and this is hard for me to say because I love the way he plays. I love watching how hard he plays. Uh, I don't love watching him try to shoot a basketball because it's disgusting. Uh, is Brandon Clark ranked 94th? Again, just not a top 100 player in the NBA. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. He's probably maybe a top five player just on his team, which is a pretty mediocre team heading into this season. In my opinion, I know they overachieved last year. I don't see Brandon Clark as the 94th best player in the NBA. He averaged 10-5-1. Uh, his PER was 
off the charts, <laughs> okay? So I'll be the first one to admit, I'm not the biggest analytics dude. I know PER matters, but there's a million um, uh, situations where I'm gonna show you PERs that just it don't make any sense. And so like a PER is not the be all end all. I know a lot of people make it that way. John Hollinger's got his list, but there's a couple of guys, you know, with incredible PERs that we know are not that good. And there's a couple of guys with very, very low PERs, which we know are incredibly valuable in every GM in the NBA would love to have him on their roster. So PER is not the be all end all. I'm using the eye test here. There's just no way that a rim running undersized power forward uh, who is kind of like an energy guy is going to be in my top 100 players. I know there it's hard to quantify defensive statistics, um, but 65% from the line can't shoot threes at all. Uh, shoots a great percentage from the field because he only dunks everything. And so PER really rewards dudes that dunk everything and don't take a lot of shots. And so that's why Brandon Clark kind of shows up with a 23.7 PER. It's just a really good number. Uh, but like I said, if your PER was that good, then you know why are you only playing 19 minutes a game? Like if Brandon Clark's so damn good, then why did his coach only think he deserved 19 minutes a game uh, last season? So Brandon Clark does doesn't belong there in my opinion the next person that doesn't belong and you can just look at the names that are around him and everyone would agree Mike Conley does not look again Mike Conley was great I loved him he used to be a great efficient point guard better defender than most people give him credit for Mike Conley does not need to be anywhere near Christian Wood Anthony Simons Buddy Heald or Yusuf Nurkic or Malcolm Brogdon for that matter He's in, a, he's in a range here with other guys who are, you know, not maybe I think they should be higher or lower or whatever, but of the list of names that I just called out, Mike Conley is an intruder. He's an imposter. Uh, he is not what he used to be. He is almost 35. He'll be 35 when the season starts. Um, he's 13, 3, and 5 last year. Shot poorly from the field, relatively poorly, not the worst. Shot great from three-point range because he was always open. Uh, shot 80% from the line. His PER is a little bit better than average, but he's become a sieve on defense. He is an absolute horrific orange cone liability on defense now. He's a tiny little human being. He's 6'1", 175. It's just very difficult to hide him. Like I said, back in 2012, look, you can see he used to be an all-defensive player. Those days are over. Uh, Mike Conley is probably not going to start the season in Utah. If he does, he's just a locker room guy. I would be shocked if they don't hand that position over to Jared Butler or, at the very least, run Colin Sexton at the point a lot. And they'll probably try to run Butler at the one, Sexton at the two, and then keep using Clarkson off the bench. Conley may start the season as the point guard, but there's no way he's finishing this season as a top 100 player in the NBA. There is absolutely no way that's possible because his decline has been rapid. His uh, decline from last year, uh, the year before to last year, was massive. And so I expect nothing different uh, this time around. So Conley doesn't belong. Karis LeVert, we just talked about it. I've got him pulled up. If you're not in the top four players on your team uh, and your team is just a pretty average team in the East, then you don't belong to be in the top 80 NBA players on any list. Uh, Karis LeVert is uh, right there smack dab in the middle of his pure prime. He was 17-3-4 last year, but he was just a very average player from an efficiency standpoint. His effective field goal percentage is under 50%, and that's his job is to score. Like his whole purpose is to score. Uh, and he was probably the you know third or fourth scoring option. I know he averaged 17 a game, but with Mobley, uh, Garland, Mitchell, his job's to score. I don't think they're going to start this guy. I think they're going to have him come off the bench and be sort of like a Jordan Clarkson guy. And guys coming off the bench just usually don't belong in the NBA top 80. Uh, he ranked 80 on ESPN's list. It's just a serious reach to me. Uh, he's a terrible three-point shooter. He's not a great free throw shooter. His effective field goal percentage is under 50%. So Karis LeVert's an imposter in my book. This is ridiculous. This is one of the most ridiculous things in the world, if you ask me. Say what you want, right? I am assuming, again, I should say, I am assuming ESPN is presuming that Ben Simmons is going to be healthy and play, you know, 70 games a year, right? That's what all of these have to assume. I doubt that ESPN took into account uh, anxiety issues, physical issues, missing games, sitting back-to-backs, weird stuff like that. Uh, if Ben Simmons is healthy and ready to play, this is just plain preposterous. He's 50 spots too high. He's a top 30 player in the NBA. Uh, as his resume will uh, substantiate, three-time All-Star. He is Rookie of the Year. I mean, look at it. Steals champs. He's probably the most versatile. He could be the Defensive Player of the Year if he locks in and plays. Again, lots of ifs, right? If his back holds up and if his brain works, 
this dude is a top 30 player in the NBA. To have him rank this far down is insane. Um, again, his three-point percentage, 14%. That's You can say, hey, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. That's great. He doesn't take him. I mean, he's probably one for seven or something. I don't know what that equates to. He literally might be one for seven. Uh, and he cannot shoot free throws. Uh, but he dunks everything. And so uh, I don't like Brandon, uh, Ben Simmons here at 76. For instance, if you ask all 30 NBA GMs who they would want as uh, on their team, Ben Simmons or the next 12 people on the list, and no single GM in the NBA would ever choose OG Ananobi, Harrison Barnes, John Collins, Michael Porter, well, maybe Michael Porter Jr., uh, Julius Randle, Al Horford, Spencer Dinwiddie, Desmond Bain, Jalen Brunson, Miles Turner, Russell Westbrook, now Russell Westbrook, Jeremy Grant. No GM in the entire NBA would ever choose Ben Simmons over any of those players that are ranked ahead of him if Ben Simmons is healthy and ready to go. Uh, so Ben Simmons is way, 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 way too low. Needs to be ranked much better. Al Horford, uh, again, he wasn't ranked last year. He turned 64 years old this year. So I don't know why ESPN thinks he vaults into the top 70 players in the NBA. That just seems preposterous to me. I mean, last year he was 10, 7, and 3. I get it. He's well-rounded. I get it. He brings toughness. He had a huge series against Giannis and a post moment against Giannis. Congrats. I do admit uh, Horford did yam on Giannis's face. Uh, he's got a little better than average PER. He, uh, he does. He's, he's a he's a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Uh, and he's 100 years old. I mean, he's 36 years old. He's going to be 37 some at some point during the season. I just don't see it. Uh, I get maybe sneaking him into the top 100 because there's something to be said about his defensive presence. He's a great position defender. Uh, no question about that. And he's had an illustrious career. Five-time All-Star. People forget that. Um, but... Uh, I can't put Al Horford top 70. I mean, you're getting there. I mean, there's 30 teams in the NBA. You're getting to the point where now you're talking about guys that should be the second best player on their NBA team, right? If there's 30 teams, you multiply it by two, that's 60. He's just outside that range. Al Horford is not a top six player on his own team. So uh, I, I don't know how you could have him at 70. If that just seems preposterous to me, again, no slight to his career, and he's a great player, that's just way too high on the list. And, and again, uh, from a fantasy standpoint, he's real solid, right? He's real. He covers all your bases. He doesn't do anything terrible, uh, but I don't see that. R.J. Barrett, this is probably the worst one that I've seen. R.J. Barrett's is a terrible NBA player. Um, again, it, could he get better? Yeah, uh, but he wasn't listed on ESPN's list last year, and he had one of the worst years of his career. When you talk about PER, like all you PER lovers, R.J. Barrett is 250th in the league. Keep in mind, the average PER of an NBA player is 15.0. Uh, his career is 12.8, and last year, R.J. Barrett was a 13.7. He didn't shoot 50% effective field goal percentage. He's a terrible free throw shooter. He's a very mediocre, at best, three-point shooter. He is a horrific field goal shooter. He could not score from the mid-range or at the rim at all last year. Part of the reason is he only goes left. He can only finish with his left. He can only shoot with his left, obviously, uh, but his mid-range game is sorely lacking. Uh, he has to take a massive step forward to be in the ESPN top. 100. Um, again, if you compare him to some of the other guys that I just talked about, yeah, I'd rather R.J. Barrett than Kevin Love and Brandon Clark and Mike Conley, but I don't think they belong in the top 100 either. Uh, let's look at some of the players around R.J. Barrett on this list. Jalen Green, um, I mean, Jalen Green was awful last year, but we expect him to take a, a step forward in his second year. R.J. Barrett's in his freaking fourth year. Uh, when is he going to take a step forward? Tyler Hero is much better. Uh, Kyle Lowry, eh, I don't think he should be there anyway. But, like, the fact that R.J. Barrett is within four spots of Tyrese Halliburton, to me, is insane. That doesn't make any sense. Let's compare the two players. We just looked at Barrett. 20 points, five boards, three assists, horrible efficiency. Tyrese Halliburton, 15 points, four boards, eight assists, running an entire team, great field goal percentage for a guard, over 40% three-point shooting, 84% free throw shooting, seven effective field goal percentage points higher than R.J. Barrett, and a 5.0 or more PER higher than R.J. Barrett. Everything about Tyrese Halliburton is 20... 
30 ranking spots better than R.J. Barrett. And on this list, he's only four. So I think Halliburton needs to move way, way, way up on this list. And I'm the one who's saying I don't think Tyrese Halliburton has much more upside, but I think he's a great player right now. I think Tyrese Halliburton is a very solid second best player on an average NBA team. Again, I don't think he's the second best player on a title team, uh, but I think he can run the one. I think he could play off the ball because he's really intelligent and makes great reads. He's a very good defender. He's a plus defender in the NBA. So I think Tyrese Halliburton needs to go a lot higher on this list. Uh, next on the list is Jaron Jackson. You guys know my thoughts. I'm not going to poop on him too bad. I just think he is one of the most overrated players in the entire NBA. Um, you know, he's a catch and shoot big. He's 6'11", 242, and he plays like, you know, uh, freaking Matt Bullard, for God's sakes. Uh, 16 and he rebounds five a game on a team where he should be getting all the rebounds, to be honest with you, with an aging Steven Adams next to him. He's a horrible free uh, field goal percentage shooter. He's a terrible terrible volume three-point shooter for some reason. I don't know why he thinks he should be taking threes, but he does. What baffles me is that he shoots free throws really well for a big, really well for anybody at 82.3%, um, but effective field goal percentage for a 6'11", 242-pound guy to be under 50% is just unacceptable. His PER is a mediocre, okay, 17. Again, better than average, but that doesn't get you in the top 50 players in the NBA, and ESPN's got him at 53. I ain't buying it. If you look at the players around him, you know, Jordan Poole should probably move up. He's a tough one to kind of piece together because so much attention's on the other players and he's got so much freedom. But like, uh, you know, Darren Fox, Jared Allen, who's an all-star, by the way, DeAndre Ayton, uh, Jamal Murray. I mean, look at the names around Jaron Jackson. One of them doesn't belong and it's Jaron Jackson. Uh, so I, I think he's ranked way, way, way too high on their list. He needs to drop way back, probably into the mid-70s, maybe the 80s, something like that. Maybe I'm wrong. Again, he's injured, right? But this list, I'm assuming, they're presuming he's going to be healthy, you know, to start the season. And this is like a pretend list, right? Obviously, ESPN either didn't do the research and didn't know how injured he was, or maybe they think he's going to be back sooner than everybody else does. Uh, Darius Garland is not ranked well enough. He needs to be ranked much better. 46th on this list, um, all-star point guard for the Cavs did absolutely anything and everything possible for that team last year. He's like a Kyrie 2.0, a little bit better distributor probably, and a little bit weaker on the scoring side of it. But I see a lot of similarities just between their height, weight, the way they move, the way they play. Uh, but Darius Garland's a little more sane version. Um, but last year he was 84th on the list. This year he's 46. So at least ESPN gave him a little bit credit of the huge step forward he took. But he is an all-star. So I would think an all-star would get you somewhere in the top 40 for sure. 46 is way too low on this list. Uh, Darius Garland's a really efficient point guard. And uh, he's remember he's on the uptick right so he's a young player on his way up unlike some of these players like the next one on our list Draymond Green who is on his way down uh, Draymond Green ranked about exactly where he was last year he was seven seven and seven uh, he's a career worse than average PER for all of you PER analytics lovers. Um, his effective field goal percentage means almost nothing because he never shoots the ball. His free throws are terrible. His threes are horrific. Uh, his field goal percentage is 52.5 because he only shoots backdoor layups and occasionally dunks a ball. Again, he's going to be 33 years old at some point early in the NBA season uh, coming up or around midseason. Um, I... I get it. It's really, again, it's really hard to quantify defense. And then you see him in these playoff series and you're like, damn, he does make a difference. And I was the first one to admit it. Man, the dude does make a difference. But this is too much, right? We're giving too much credit for what he's done in the past. And we're giving him a little too much credit for the impact he has on the game from a leadership and defensive standpoint. Good player, 50, uh, you know, 55, 65, 70. Yeah, sure, of course, right? But he's such a liability on offense. I just think there's a lot of other guys that you could play plug into that position who might not defend as well, but would give you so much more on offense. He's just the right player in the right place at the right time. He's just on a team with a bunch of epic historic scores and bucket getters and a bunch of athletes around him that you know his lack of ability on offense is just so covered up by those around him that it's just you know it's it's negligible so um i think you put him on a different team he falls either out of the top 100 or very much so you know in the high 80s or 90s something like that again i know what he has done and what he's been in the past 
but he's not the same player right now. And seven, seven, and seven just doesn't cut it for me, uh, especially when five of the seven passes that he gets assists on are dribble handoffs, where he just dribbles, turns his butt to you, and shields. Um, and again, he's got the greatest shooters. He's got two of the greatest five shooters probably in the history of the league on his team. And then he's got Jordan Poole, who's no slouch himself and was one of the best shooters in the NBA last year. So how hard is it to get assists on dribble handoffs and circle dribbles? You know, it's just, I think his assists are very much overrated. Uh, and then again, how hard is it to rebound when that's really all you're doing is rebounding? Uh, LaMelo Ball uh, is just, he's much better than this. Zion Williamson is much better than this. Both of these guys, yes, I get that they're young, uh, but if we're assuming that Zion Williamson is healthy, there is no way in hell after what we saw in that, you know, brief stint a year and a half ago uh, that Zion Williamson is the number 40 ranked player in the NBA. That's just absolutely stupid. To be ranked behind Fred Van Vliet, Clay Thompson, a freaking Marcus Smart, that's probably the most ridiculous thing on this entire list is that Marcus Smart is ranked 34th on this list. That is absolutely asinine. I, can't, I don't understand it. I've never seen anything that ridiculous. Again, is he a top five player on his team? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but is he the 34th ranked player in the NBA? Is he one slot below Kyrie Irving? That is insane, man. Uh, ESPN, get your shit together. That's that's ridiculous. That's not good. Like this this list can be thrown in the trash. When somebody sees Marcus Smart ranked between Cade Cunningham and Kyrie Irving, ask 30 GMs for one year. I know Cade Cunningham is much younger, but ask 30 GMs which player they want next year. And uh, 30 out of 30 are going to take Cade Cunningham because Cade Cunningham can do what Marcus Smart can do, but Marcus Smart can never do what Cade Cunningham does. Um, so I, there's just no way, man. I'm sorry. I'm not buying that. And to compare Marcus Smart and Andrew Wiggins, for that matter, to Kyrie Irving is just insane. Uh, let's pull up Marcus Smart's numbers. He was 12 12.1, 3.8, and six, almost six assists a game last year. Running a little bit of that point guard position. Uh, terrible shooter, terrible three-point shooter. Pretty good free throw shooter, believe it or not. Pretty average effective field goal percentage for a guard. Horrible PER. Career PER of 12.5. He was worse than uh, on Hollinger's list. He was a 13.6 PER. He's not in the top 250 players in PER, so let that sink in. The guy that ESPN thinks is in the top 34 players in the NBA, which, re remember, we're getting to the top 30, which would be, if there's 30 NBA teams, you're talking about guys that should be the best, or at the very least, the second best player on their team. He's not close, right? He's not remotely close to that. And you can't tell me the Celtics have five of the top 40 players in the NBA, uh, but Marcus Smart's here at 34. Again, if Robert Williams is healthy, I definitely have Robert Williams ahead of Marcus Smart. But that's just me. I think Marcus Smart almost does more harm on offense than he does good on defense. And him getting the Defensive Player of the Year last year was silly. It was just straight up stupid. He's not even the best defensive player on his team. Um, Kyrie Irving, got to be way higher. If Kyrie Irving's brain is right and he's healthy and the earth is round, there's no way Kyrie Irving is the 33rd best player in the NBA. Kyrie Irving is definitely at or near the top 20. Andrew Wiggins does not belong on here. I understand he had a good year last year, but was it that good uh, to vault him all the way up to 32nd? Amongst players like Kyrie Irving, uh, Clay Thompson, who's a better player on his own team, uh, Fred Van Vliet, who's an all-star. You know, I know Wiggins got that all-star nod, but go look and see what Wiggins did after the all-star break. I know he had a good playoffs, and, and he was great, and he was nails, man. I get all that, but uh, let's not let recency bias cloud our judgment because there's he's got a long history of playing in the NBA. Sorry for that. And uh, 32 is just a stretch. Again, you want to put Wiggins at 50 to 55, go for it, right? But don't put him at 32 right next to uh, Chris Middleton, who is a closer and the second best player on a championship team, uh, who's also in his prime, by the way. So uh, the list from here actually isn't terrible, okay? Um, there's some things you can nitpick. Players should go up or down a few spots here and there. Uh, you know, like I'm going to have Brandon Ingram uh, probably ahead of DeMar DeRozan. Even though DeRozan had a bang-up year last year, I admit it. Uh, I just think, you know, young players are on the uptick. Older players are going to be a little bit more on the decline. Again, a lot of what DeRozan did was because he had to do it because he didn't have the players around him. They were all injured all the year. Um, so uh, Drew Holiday 
at 26. Drew Holiday ahead of Chris Middleton is suspicious, and I'm a Bucks fan. I love Drew Holiday. I love everything he brings. He's a dog defender. I mean, I get all those things, but like, come on, man. I mean, Chris Middleton's making the All-Star team every single year. Drew Holiday's never made the All-Star team, as far as I know. I might be wrong on that. Maybe he did make an All-Star team, but I don't think he did. Uh, let's pull that up because I don't want to sound like an idiot. Uh, did Drew Holiday ever make an All-Star team? He did. He made one All-Star team, so he must have made it last year. Uh, four times all defensive. We, we get it. He's great. I mean, I love Drew Holiday. He's a buck, of course, so I'm biased, and I really love him, but like, don't put him ahead of Middleton. Come on, that's ridiculous. Um, Donovan Mitchell, uh, one of the biggest droppers on ESPN's list last year, as you can see, was Anthony Davis was top 10 last year at number nine. This year, he's at number 20. Again, He's, he's tough, right, because I think he's a wuss, you know, I think he's soft, and, and I think he's content, uh, I think he's capable of so much more, but, and this is, every time you mention Anthony Davis' name, it's either a but or an if, if healthy, Anthony Davis is definitely better than the 20th best player in the NBA, I mean, Anthony Davis is a much better basketball player than you know, Rudy Gobert. Nobody in the NBA, uh, other than maybe the Timberwolves, apparently, would rather Rudy Gobert on their team than Anthony Davis. That's silly. I mean, Anthony Davis is a better defender. I mean, you can talk about all the awards you want. Anthony Davis is a better defender than Rudy Gobert. Problem is, dude can't stay on the court uh, or doesn't want to stay on the court. But an engaged, um, aggressive, healthy, uh, consistent Anthony Davis is leaps and bounds a better player uh, than Rudy Gobert. In my personal opinion, uh, argue all you want about defense. I think that's what and what, as we say here in Louisiana. But offensively, I mean, come on. It's silly, right? And there's two sides to the to the game. There's offense and defense. Um, Jimmy Butler seems a little bit high for me, um, you know, but, I mean, it is what it is. He does a lot of different things, and he's probably the best player on the Miami Heat team. Maybe Bam out of bio, depending on your opinion, you know, but Bam's right there behind him at 23. Um, and then the list is really not bad here. The only one that really stands out is, of course, Kevin Durant being ninth, being anywhere behind Jason Tatum is dumb. Uh, but, uh, you know, Kevin Durant being ninth seems like a stretch, uh, or eighth, I'm sorry. Um, John Morant, as you can see, vaulted uh, from 31 all the way up to nine. Kyrie we, Kyrie, Kawhi Leonard was not on the list, and he jumps all the way up to 12, which I'm with if he's healthy and he's playing every game. You know, I'm with that, Ka Kawhi being there, uh, even though he's touched past the uh, the age of 30. Um, Harden, Booker, Morant, Durant. Uh, again, I don't have a lot of problem with these guys in this range. Lillard, we're assuming he's going to be healthy. He was eight last year on their list. He's 14 this year because there's some injury concerns. We want to see if that abdominal strain is all good to go, you know, post-surgery. Uh, Kevin Durant being ranked eighth is just silly. Um, there's no way he's, he's ranked eighth. He's just not. I mean, Kevin Durant is definitely uh, fourth or fifth. I mean, I don't. I mean, I know Curry ended with a bang and had a great season, but I mean, you know, if you ask NBA GMs and they knew Kevin Durant was actually going to show up and honor his contract, would you take Kevin Durant behind Tatum for one season? I mean, if we're talking about the next seven seasons, you know, Tatum's got the age on him, uh, but LeBron James, you taking Durant or LeBron James? Is LeBron James sixth? Is LeBron James really behind Steph Curry? Uh, I mean, I know Steph had a great season. Again, just remember the teammates that you have around you have a big impact on what you look like and, and your performance and your team's winning percentage. It's not just a one-man show. So I don't know. Uh, I do agree Giannis won. Uh, I do agree Jokic two. And I do agree Doncic three. After that, it gets a little dicey for me. Uh, with Durant, LeBron, and Embiid, uh, I would have probably as my next three. And then, um, you know, I would have probably Kawhi actually a little bit higher on this list. And then, uh, you know, Curry and, and LeBron right there with, uh, with Embiid. It's just tough, man. It's tough when you get up to the top, splitting hairs. And again, <clears throat> maybe I'm a little bit biased. I've got a lot of fantasy basketball influence here, so I'm thinking about fantasy basketball as well. So uh, let me know what you think. If anybody stands out on this list, if you think I'm just nutso, gutso, whatever, just tell me. That's fine. Uh, I don't make these videos for everybody to agree with everything I say. It's just food for thought, and it's an awesome conversation piece. And it's funny that I have such a problem with you know the the back end of the list more so than the top end of the list. Most people would you know hyper focus on that, but all those guys are great players, and any of those guys can make seven to eight spot ranking jumps, just depending on what type of season they have and whether they stay healthy or don't stay healthy. Uh, it's back here where I really kind of have a problem because, you know, honestly, it's just insulting for somebody to think that, you know, Marcus Smart is the 34th best player in the NBA. Like that, to me, like, 
I immediately discredit your list and I'm just going to chop it up because nobody in their right mind could possibly think that uh, or that Andrew Wiggins is number 32 or that he's better than, than Kyrie Irving. That's just silly, man. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you agree with. Let me know in the comments what you don't agree with, which is fine. Just be cordial about it. Uh, we can have a, 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 you know, a thoughtful, logical conversation about this for sure. And I didn't dig real deep into the stats. I just kind of looked at it and ran the eye test across it. Uh, again, I wish I had 10 hours to go through and pick this list apart and then I could give you some data to support the stuff. But, um, you know, a lot of it is just uh, hinges on, you know, uptick of young players who are expected to improve their numbers. And then the downturn of some of the older players like a Conley, like a Marcus Smart, you know, guys like that who I think are only going to get worse year after year. And they've started to get worse at a precipitous rate uh, of decline. So uh, let me know what you think. And let me know if anybody stands out to you that you think shouldn't have been on the list or was ranked too high or too low. And, uh, and let me know why in the comments. I appreciate you guys watching. Keep collecting. Stay positive in the hobby and peace.